I really like Persona. Ever since 2020, I couldn't get enough of this series. I started with Persona 4, then I went into 3, and then immediately into 5 as it came out on PC. I bought limited edition merch such as pins, plushies, uh, and even the Persona 3 movies. Uh, in addition, the first video essay ever on my channel was about Persona 4. So it's safe to say that I'm a huge fan of this series and it has a huge impact on my early adult life. With a possible remake of the original series coming on the horizon, it got me thinking, what was the original series like? And I was followed by with, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? And I jumped right into the series. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't wanna wake up, nah. Nah, cause I'm happy here. Yeah, yeah. For this video, I'll be playing through the PlayStation Portal version of the game, which has more updated graphics and more quality of life features. With all that being said, this is Persona 1. The game opens in a dark, empty classroom. Students are bickering and discussing of a horrific rumor, the ability to peer into the future along with powers beyond their wildest dreams. Persona? One says, if that really works, and I can see the future, I'll be on Easy Street. You sure you ain't got that brain rot? <laughs> Turns out there's more to it than an easy joke. Maybe not seeing the future, but weird stuff does happen. I want to put my money where my mouth is if you are. Meet the two people in the conversation, Masao and Hidehiko. Masao, a spoiled kid whose family runs the local dry cleaners, and Hidehiko, a more chill person who just loves attention. Hidehiko has been selling to the group for weeks now that Persona is real, and all you have to do is to do a ritual for it to work. Masao, rightfully so, calls bullshit and agrees to a bet for an all-you-can-eat dinner at the local diner aptly named Peace Diner. Everyone on the sideline starts placing their bets. I vote for Hidehiko. Me too. This won't work. I agree. Well, what about you? That leads to, well, you. Meet Naoya, a second-year student at St. Hermeline High School. One by one, each student in a corner would chant, Persona, Persona, come here, before walking to the next participant. Persona, 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 come here. And then... Nothing. Huh. Well, I, I guess that's the end of the game, huh? Hidehiko's wrong, and she feel dumb for wasting everyone's time. Hey, look, you even made a little girl cry. Who would even do that? Wait, I don't even remember mentioning you. Who are you? Oh my god, the ritual worked. Huh? It's too late now to ask to... Whoa! Help me. What? What the... You can help! We wake up in an isolated tower in an unfamiliar plane. A masked man named Philemon greets us, and he identifies himself as being in between the unconscious and conscious state. Philemon introduces us to the power of Persona, the mask we use in our everyday life. Judging by the one sense that we said so far in the game, Philemon declares that we have a good grasp on our identity, and thus grants us the power of Persona. And we're greeted to the Persona named Simon Congo, representing the Arcana of Strength, which is associated with mortality of self-control, gentleness, courage, and virtue. Simon is a character in Hindu lore and a protector in Japanese Buddhist lore. He's caused diseases and suffering, and as a result of looking back on his past, he has dedicated himself to protecting victims that have fallen ill because of his actions. A Persona that's oddly fitting for us, given our situation. A flash of light, and then we wake up in St. Hermeline High School. A very perverted nurse greets us. <laughs> Welcome to the infirmary. You sure look cute when you're asleep. Do not call me cute when I'm asleep. What the fuck's wrong with you? We also see familiar faces from the ritual. Masao, along with Kei Nanjo, a professional dweeb, and I say this in the most derogatory way possible. And you can Mayazumi, treated as an older sister of the group. That's all she's really known for. Our homeroom teacher, Saiko, runs into the room and is grateful that we're okay. Once I assure her that, no, I, I'm not okay, and would like the nurse to leave me alone now, she tells us to go to the Kage Hospital to get checked up on, despite us already being in the infirmary. She also mentions of a student named Maki, and that we should visit her as she's been there for over a year. As we're about to leave the school, Kei's butler, Yamaoko, stops by to check up on him. Oh my god, Master K, you're hanging out with your crowd of friends. Oh, I'm so excited for you. I hope you have an amazing time. 
Oh, Yamaoka, you're being cringe. Leave me alone. Anyway, we head to the hospital, and after checking in, we decide to say hello to Maki. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, I've been spotted. I, I would ask that you keep my presence a secret from the young master. I also certainly enjoy keeping people waiting. Don't, don't know if time is money. So, I guess no narcs. No narcs. The room has one neutral color. Building blocks that are partly assembled, a teddy bear to cover her during her most challenging days, an award-winning painting called Gate to Paradise, that you can tell how much of a toll it took on her. And the artist herself, in the middle of it, Maki. Maki thanks everyone for attending, especially after requesting everyone to show up when Masao visited last. Right, that, that's why we're here, because Masao remembered and told everyone to be here. Right. So it looks like we've been friends for quite some time now. I've been doing really well recently. I wonder if it's because of that dream I had. A dream, huh? What's the dream about, Maki? She mentions it's hard to remember, but she remembers having the dream of a nice man that reminds her of a father figure. <laughs> like the doctor, you can chimes in? No. Uh oh. <laughs> From here, Maki does a little bit of small talk with everyone. She brings up that her mom still works at the organization called Seabeck, which was an immediate sore spot for her, as she Maki blows up and starts saying that she's not her real mom, that she's a workaholic, and blah. Uh, Maki, you you brought it up. You could have just said you were fine. No one would have no one would have known. No! Maki screams and everyone runs to get a nurse. Everyone is standing outside of the ICU, hoping everything is okay. I do hope it's nothing serious. Damn it. When suddenly, an earthquake. <laughs> an earthquake? Whoa, it's a big one! The hell? It seems to have subsided. Maki! Whoa! What the hell? Hmm. Yeah, usually these lead to other rooms. Huh? That scream! It came from downstairs! Let's go! We see a destroyed room with horrors only from our worst nightmares. Zombies and demons surrounding the room, and on the floor, we see Yamaoka. And now, the first combat begins. Before we can respond, Saiman comes in to strike him for us. Thou art I, and I am thou. From the sea of thy soul I cometh. I shall lend you my strength. The other's personas come to life as well. The south persona, Ogu, a god from Yoruba mythology known as a god of iron. When humans needed help the most, Ogu provided iron tools which were significantly stronger than the tools they were using. And as a result, humans were able to thrive. Oh, a uh, fun fact, Ogun's first tool was an iron axe to help chop down the thick trees, which is why Masao wields an axe randomly. Or it's something I assume because they never actually explain why he has an axe randomly. Hmm. Kei's persona, Aizen Mayuyo, is considered a great wisdom king, representing the state of sexual excitement or agitation becoming enlightenment and passionate love to become compassion for all the big things. And you can know his persona, Vesta, which I will explain another time. It's really not that important, I, trust me. The fight ends with no input from the player, and now we turn to our attention to Yamaoko, a dear and beloved friend to everyone. No, Yamaoko, don't go! You were so important to the plot, and you were really important to the player! Remember me, Kay? Become the number one businessman all of Japan! <sighs> anyway. Everyone mentions about hearing their persona talk to them, about lending their power, and giving them the title of persona. After that, we travel through the hospital. Traveling through the rearranged hospital, doctors and nurses are scrambling in their safe havens, trying to figure out what has happened as demons and zombies storm the halls, gaining their bearings of their new home. As the party escapes the hospital, a nurse is trapped under a vending machine. Help me, please, the nurse cries. We have no time. Zombies are around the corner, Kay says. And now I'm left with a difficult decision. Do I help the nurse 
or do I help myself? Give up! It could really use a hand, Naoya. A helper. Okay. Take that side. No good, they're coming! The zombies surround us as I help the nurse. Perhaps this is our end, too. Oh, there are demons here, too? What? Meet Eriko, another student from the Ritual, described as, quote, beautiful and intelligent. She jumps directly into combat with her fencing sword in hand, and she summons her own persona, Nikki, which I will get to at another time. After the fight, the party identifies a commonality. They have all dreamed of a butterfly. Perhaps this dream is the reason why we have these powers? Eriko tells us that there's much worse outside, and it's impossible to leave town. And also Linus knows that the only safe place to be is at the school. But before we go, we need to go to the shrine first, as Maki's mother is there. So, off we go to face demons and find Maki's mother before going to the school. Okay, let's start combat. The game has a five-party grid formation system, meaning that you can place a character anywhere on your side, and it can impact who you can target and who can target you. If you place your character in the front, you have a wide range of attacks at your disposal, but those are more likely to be targeted as well. There's also two styles of combat. First, using melee damage using the sword or axe that you have at hand. And the other is using your persona to cast spells and abilities, such as a lightning attack or even a status effect that gives you more damage. You can also communicate with the demons, and if you're successful, they will give you a spell card, which we can talk about later. Now, when we get to the shrine, we find Maki's mother on the floor. But before we can help her, Philemon contacts us through a butterfly. He asks us how we're doing, and personally, Philemon, not so hot. My world's flipping upside down, but thank you for asking. He disregards what to say, which, rude, and informs us that up ahead, there'll be difficult decisions to make, and that every choice that we make is of our own free will. A flash of light, and we return back to the shrine. It seems that everyone had the same dream, and we all talk about how interesting it was. I wish you acknowledged how I felt, you know, my life just been turned upside down, and it's kind of horrible for me. I got this new demon thing, that's kind of interesting, and oh my god, I forgot about Maki's mom. Meet Setosuku Sonomura, Maki's mom. That, that, that's it. She also works at the Seabeck Engineering Specialist, but that's really it. Setosuku has been shot by the leader of Seabeck, Kendori. She informs us that we need to tell the police, but Eriko brings up that the police station is overrun by zombies and demons. Setosuku tells us that there's an underground entrance to the Seabeck building in the abandoned factory, and gives us a security pass before passing out. Must I okay go to the police station anyway, despite Eriko's warning? leaving us to attend to Setosuko and taking her to the school. While we're at the school, there are a couple people worth mentioning. There's a kid named Tasumu Kiori, who is also nicknamed Devil Boy, a kid in cult attire who talks a little bit too much about the occult and often spreads misinformation. If we talk to him, he mentions the Snow Queen curse. During the annual drama show, whoever plays the role of Snow Queen will die of an unnatural death as a result of the cursed mask they wear. Ooh. <laughs> Tell you what, if this video gets, um, 15 likes, I'll indulge Devil Boy and hear more about the Snow Queen curse. Deal? Deal. Alright, we also meet Yuka Ayes, another student who is at the ritual. And next to her, we meet Yuko Himeno, a meek student that has to work part time to support her family. They're hanging around the broken wall of the school that is left for Kei and Masao. We attempt to leave through the broken wall to help Masao and Kei at the police station, knowing fully well that they probably shouldn't have gone there. But before we do, Maki opens the door behind us. <laughs> huh? How did you leave the hospital? Turns out, I'm not the only one with that question. Maki reassures us that she is indeed Maki, which... Hmm... And she has no idea what we're talking about. Yuka points out that she's eerily cheerful despite being in the hospital for a whole year. Maki also mentions that something is off with Yuka, but before we can even go into detail, Kei shows up through the wall without Masao. Kei lets us know that Masao has been captured, which, surprise, surprise, and that we need to go back to the police station. So off we go with Kei and Maki to save Masao. As we leave, Maki is jumped by a demon. During the fight, we discover her persona, Meso, a Chinese goddess who protects fishermen and sailors from the dangers of the sea. Before becoming a goddess, she was also well known for her swimming prowess and eventually guiding sailors. She would later sacrifice her life to save her brother from the sea. As we travel to the police station, we're also introduced to the final form of combat. Guns! Guns work as you might have thought. You shoot the enemy. There are different weapons that only certain characters are allowed to use. For example, the main character is allowed to use a submachine gun, and Kay is allowed to use a sniper rifle. Later, we'll be able to upgrade our guns to add debuffs to our opponent, which is kind of cool, but unless you're trying to make the game harder for yourself, 
just use your persona. There are very few times where your persona will be unable to be effective and you can't just swing your weapon at them. So, two and a half styles of combat. Anyway, the police station has been ransacked. The town's only line of defense from the demonic invasion has fallen. After obtaining the prison key that Kay could not find... Hmm... We make our way to the holding cells, where we find Masao. And Hidehiko! Oh hey, what's up? How did you get here? Apparently, he was also looking for weapons, but he got detained. But why would demons hold people instead of just killing them? The lieutenant and officer come from the side room, embracing their new demonic powers. They have become corrupt, and with their new powers, they have sought to execute us. And here, we have our first boss fight. Is what I would say if this wasn't a glorified cutscene. Yep, we get to watch everyone fight instead of participating in it. But hey, we get to learn about Hidehiko's persona, Nemhain. A member of the three goddesses to represent the aspects of Morgan, the Celtic goddess of battle, death, fate, strife, and fertility in Irish mythology. Nemhain represents the status of frenzy and panic. She often would strike those feeling in both foe and allies alike. After the fight, the game asks us if we would like to bring Hidehiko along with us to fight Seabeck. Yeah, so apparently Hidehiko is an optional fifth party member, and we had the option to pick between him and Yuka. The game didn't properly explain this to us, but hey. Next time, right? Right? There's a next time, right? Right? The right. party moves to the abandoned factory, covered in spray paint made by others, but mostly Masao, which is, hey, pretty well done. Unbeknownst to him, underneath was the Seabeck headquarters, which was accessible from, I kid you not, 20 feet away from Masao's work. And thus, our breach into the base has started. Then the passage is crawling with demons in both new and old alike such as the police lieutenant at the police station and some interesting looking birds. Hey, <laughs> your power's like this, because I'm super jealous. Oh, you guys can't see, but she's, they're angry. Oh, women who, women who try to lead men on are the poor. Oh, what the fuck, Andrew Tate looking ass bird? This area isn't too noteworthy, mind you. Just flip two switches and the door opens and we finally officially enter the Seabeck building. The floors are in luxurious black tiles and marble green walls to match. Demons have seemed to enter the area too, but people have seemed unfazed by their existence. Some of the people in the area are even tend to be friendly towards us despite us breaking in. Eh? You came, came through the basement? For rumors of a division down there, that's a secret even to employees. You see you went through it? Uh, yes ma'am. And some members of Seabeck even fight alongside the demons. After making it to the top of the building, we hear two people talking behind the door. They're upset that Sidisuko successfully escaped. Kicking down the door, we have officially meet Kandori. Kay talks like him and Kandori are old, bitter rivals, which I am confident he does not know you like that. Kandori is immediately uninterested with us and leaves us to fight the first official boss of the game, Takida, Kandori's right-hand man. Before leaving, Kendori shows us his persona, as well as Takeda. We don't actually get to know what Takeda's persona is, but if we bring Eriko with us, she identifies it as a faceless god, the Crawling Chaos. Ooh. The fight is pretty straightforward. Kill the ads that Takeda brought in, and just spam heal. And it's pretty straightforward. Kendori has escaped through the hidden hallway blocked by the Seabeck logo. The black tiles and marble walls are replaced with hollow metal and blood red walls. The polite receptionists are now replaced with scientists trying to figure out why the demons are emerging in town. Seabeck's intentions are on full blast now. Parts of the hidden area are covered in black smoke, making it difficult to figure out your bearings, which makes it difficult as demons and men in black try to stop you from exploring. When we finally catch up to Kendori, we meet him in the experimentation chamber. He asks his doctor, Nikolai, about the adjustments and if they are complete or not. Nikolai begs for him to reconsider, pleading for everyone's sake that Kandori put this away. Kandori does not. He believes that all of mankind must atone for their sins and nothing must stop him from what needs to be done, not even a child's life. From here, we identify that the machine is a dimensional rift and that Kandori wants to use it to help humanity face Judgment Day early. We believe we have him surrounded and we can put an end to us, except we don't. Into the two by go. Okay. You didn't have the budget to animate that? We see the lights flashing red around the machine with Kendori and Nikolai in it. This leaves the party again in an argument about what to do next. 
Can we leave Nikolai in there despite doing nothing wrong? Or do we leave him there as a result of Kendori's doing, sealing away both their fate? Maki notices that the machine next to us can either increase the output or make the machine stop entirely. We're left once again with a very difficult decision to make. What do we do? Saving him with red. I'm thinking, fuck it. Listen, Nikolai knew what he was doing. And then both died based opinion. Blue button. We're hit with the blinding light. Did we do the right thing? After the flash, we are met with a little girl dressed in all black. She claims that Kendori is her father. After a flash of light, we're in an empty gym floor. But we're at the Seabeck headquarters. What happened? A student rushes into the gym, telling us to help Yosuke as he's seriously hurt because of the girl in black. What is going on? It appears that we have entered a parallel universe. Similar in nature to our world, but notably different. Going through the halls of the school, we could find notable differences in the people we once knew. Miss Saiko, our favorite teacher, is less vocal and more depressed. Principal Oishi and Vice Principal Hanya are more friendly to the students when they were otherwise cold and strict. Yuko, a student who had to work hard along with going to school to help her family, was now suddenly rich and flexing their wealth by purchasing bodyguards to defend them from ongoing demon attacks. Finally, we meet Yosuke, a student that was rumored to have gone missing two months ago. Turns out, he's here, and possibly was the kid that Kendori tested on. He confirms that this is an alternate reality, and is similar to the many worlds theory, where there are countless worlds, and in this world that we are in, there are some changes, such as the police station is now a forest, and the hospital is now a castle. Yosuke also confirms that the Maki who's with us right now is not from our world, and the Maki that we know is still somewhere in the hospital. However, this world's Maki believes that if we defeat Kendori, we can merge the worlds together. Masao points out that when Yosuke was last seen, he was with Chisedo, his partner. She is in this world, but the girl in black took her. Our conversation abruptly ends with the girl in black shaking up the school and removing the exits. So our next goal is simple. Defeat the girl in black who is somewhere in the school along with the many other demons. While we are searching for her, I thought it would be a good time to mention all the changes in the characters from the original Japanese version to the US port of the game. As mentioned earlier, I am playing through the PSP version of the game, but it originally came out on the PlayStation 1, which had much more changes from the soundtrack, to even having names that are more English friendly, such as Hidehiko got changed to Brad, K got changed to Nate, and Ellie got changed to Ellen, despite their nickname is in English and that'll just be easier, right? Just, just, just use that one. Ugh. They also changed some of the character sprite designs. Some are more subtle than others, such as Eriko's to be more blonde. K and Naoya were given changes in their hair color to make them more loser-like. And Masao was race swapped along with being named to Mark. That, that's, that's too much to unpack there. There's also another mechanic I forgot to mention, which is Persona Fusions. Throughout the game, we can meet Igor in an empty, really empty velvet room. He got some demons singing and playing the piano though, so that's, that's going for him. Using the spell cards you received in the game by talking to demons, you can fuse them to make powerful personas. Kind of cool mechanic that will help us throughout the game. Okay, so we finally caught up to the girl in black. She is in the school courtyard and... Shut up, monkey. You cannot call him that. You cannot call him that. You cannot call him that. Do you... One of the... Her name is Aki, by the way. How do we know this? No clue. She merely fights us with a robot cat with a Gatling gun and has the worst music ever for a boss fight. Why this boss music? I don't understand. The fight was immediate pushover. Aki escapes while we fight the cat, and everyone can now leave the school. Before we do, Yosuke comes back to the courier to let us know about a guy who can help us get back to our world. 
in the library, we meet Devil Boy. Usually, we know this guy as a person with questionable information on the occult, but for some reason, he's more informed, collectible, and more trustworthy. He basically confirmed that everything we know, but now introduces us to the Black Door in the library. The goal for us is easier said than done. We need to go to the following strings of fate and meet where it's all connected. In other terms, confront Kendori. We can also do ourselves a favor by going to the shrine to meet a monkey-suited gentleman. Masao tries to make a joke to lighten up the mood and god damn it. You cannot call this man that. <laughs> Especially in the English port. Go into the shrine. It appears that nothing is there until a golden butterfly starts flying around. It's Philemon. Hey. He comes to us once again to tell us about the subway station to get access to the other side of town and get to Kendori. But there is a strong guardian that cannot be defeated unless we have the expel mirror which is somewhere within the town. Finding the mirror may take months or even years of our time. Wh where do we start? Where do we go? Where do we... Oh, hey, look, I, I found it. Huh. Going through the subway terminal, there's a lot of twists, turns, and one-way passages, making it difficult to train confidently like we did in the real world. When we get to the end, a giant sea monster named Yogg Soth Jr. stands in front of us. How do we even know their name? Do they have name tags? He refuses to let us pass and now starts the third boss fight. Yogg uses water effects and would periodically try to paralyze the party, but it's a pretty straightforward fight. Just spam heals and move on with your day. Yogg gets depressed that he was defeated by a people he was tasked to stop, and then he vanishes. And behind him, we see its summoner, Aki. She tells us that up ahead is where she lives, and if we go there, we will never come out and then teleports away. Spooky. Exiting the subway, we can now visit the Black Market, a deep, dark, and mysterious shop filled with wares that are unfamiliar. You can tell this because the color of the area is gray compared to the shop on the other side, which is more colorful and good, I, I guess. More gooder? Hmm. The market has everything you expect in the strip mall. I'm to buy healing places, Igor sitting alone in the velvet room listening to the same song over and over again. However, there is one difference. One door we cannot enter. It is blocked by a man saying that the queen isn't seeing anyone and to come back later. Huh. Alright. Entering the nearby diner, we see a group of people who look like they're in drag, gambling, and talking about the harem queen. Yes, the harem queen is our salvation! Screams one in the background. The bartender named Master, <laughs> okay, raises his glass to the toast of the harem queen. Speaking to the bartender, he declares that no one is allowed to leave the market. Our only option now is to speak to the Harem Queen ourselves, in the Harem Queen's lair. We entered the Queen's lair. It is covered with dead ends, pitfalls, and male worshippers. To get through the labyrinth, it requires to jump through certain pitfalls in a certain order. Honestly, kind of a cool and unique fresh way to do a puzzle. Well done. However. There is something about this dungeon that becomes more apparent from here on out, and that is the enemy formations. To explain, much like how the party has a grid system, so does the enemies. But that certain combinations of enemies can be very toxic, especially when you learn how status effects work. So how each debuff works in the game, so when you get hit with a status effect such as guilt, you won't be able to hit the enemy because you feel, well, guilty. If you have one stack of the effect, you can still use your persona to do damage. Until you have a second stack, in which case you can't do anything, not even summon your persona. Right, you have one you have one part of the debuff and it's kind of it's kind of annoying, but whatever, but the second debuff is damaging, right? Throw that idea away when you get to being charmed. Being charmed, you can only attack your allies regardless if you have one or two stacks on it. The difference is its duration. Now, when you're faced with a roster of enemies, that want to cast Marion Kiss, which is an AO fucking E charm, and they constantly charm your party, basically soft lock you out of the game. Please. When you finally get to the bottom of the lair, we finally face the Harem Queen, which is Ch Chisato. She welcomes everyone to her palace, a palace that was made off the back of Aki's magic. She's able to wish for anything she wants with her mirror, but her payment is a growth of moles on her face. 
a notable sacrifice, and she would often brag about her perfect skin. Maki tries to convince Jusato to put an end to her reign and to come home with Yosuke. He's terribly hurt and worried for you. She pauses for a moment, but immediately disregards what's being said, as she only started dating him because she knew Maki liked him. And instead of letting them be happy together, she interfered. But why? It is because she believed that she was a better artist than Maki, and everyone liked Maki's art better. What? You're mad because someone's drawing is better than someone else's? Just get good. I... Oh my god. Apparently, Jusato believes that she's better in every way to Maki, but everyone else likes her more. I wonder why. So in her palace, she made everyone fawn over her beauty and praised her for the artist that she is, instead of improving on it and finding people who actually find her attractive for who she is. She then teleports everyone back to the bar. The party agrees that we need to go back and confront her again. Which means... Finally getting back to her chamber, we see she's covered with more moles. She shows us a piece of painting that she worked on and asks us what we think of it. Maki tries to compliment her, but she disregards it, claiming it is a false compliment. She shows us a piece that Maki made next and forced the party one by one to say her art is better than Maki's. If they refuse, they will turn to stone. She turns to us to answer first, but Masao speaks up with this taste from the art and God, oh my God. You cannot call this man that. You cannot call him that. Everyone but Maki and Naoya turn to stone. We are asked once again for our verdict and I want an honest answer. Maki's is better. Maki shows up from behind us saying, if she kills us, she'll turn her face back to normal. And now we start the fourth boss fight. Jisato shows us the back of her head, revealing the real harem queen. Turns out, Jisato is just a vessel. The fight is immediately unique as you only have a fraction of your party members, making it more difficult to do tactics that were you already did to begin with to get here. One of the major tools that she has is turning us to stone, basically soft walking us from the game. Huh, that's kind of an ongoing theme now, huh? After defeating her, Aki is disappointed in Jisato, saying that she wasn't even going to fix her face in the first place, and she's going to be stuck that way forever before vanishing away. Despite everything we've been through, Maki offers to fix her face once they defeat Aki. But the damage is already done. Her face will permanently be covered with moles, and this makes Jisato feel hopeless. Perhaps she feels like she deserved this fate. After all, she was acting horrible for everyone around her and making herself the center of attention. Maki reassures her that there are positives in her, such as her beauty, fashion sense, energetic, and her self-possessed. Jisato just misses the compliments entirely. They're all an act. Suddenly, Yosuke magically appears into the chamber. Happy to finally meet his partner once again. What happened? Yosuke says. I missed you so much. Is everything okay? Maki attempts to cover for Jisato by saying Aki cursed her, but Jisato does something remarkable. She owns up for her poor decisions. It acknowledges her actions as cruel and horrific and deserving of this fate. Yosuke pauses and reassures her that he is also no saint. And despite his past feelings for Maki, he likes Shiseido now. He doesn't care what she looks like now. Yosuke loves Shiseido for who she is. Within that moment, the mirror shatters, and Shiseido's face returns to normal. The curse has been lifted. Shiseido and Yosuke embrace. As the party returns to normal, we reflect on the lesson they have learned. Perhaps it is only normal to be tempted with wanting more in life, and to be recognized for your accomplishments. However, we also need to be humble with where we are now. There is no cheat code to success. The only thing we can do is focus on the now. And if we are true to ourselves, we'll find people who love us unconditionally. Now that we're allowed to leave the market, we make our way to the Kendori's residence, the Mana Castle. Aki's waiting for us in the front. She taunts us by telling us that there's no way to get in unless you have a moon-shaped piece. And she hints that another one exists in the Lost Forest. 
which is on the west side of the city, which means traversing back to the subway and then coming to terms with one of the game's biggest flaws. The leveling process is atrocious. Let me explain. So the game expects you to craft personas with Igor using the spell cards you've obtained by building rapport with the devils in the game. The issue? Unless you have a higher level than the demons, they will not give you the spell card, which makes it difficult to get new personas. So I'll just level up, Panda. <laughs> Here's the issue with that. The leveling process is very, very, very slow. And with the constant risk of getting soft locked in the game at any given moment, it is high risk for a very low reward. So I did what any rational person would do and grinded out the game. And by grinded, I mean I add a few lines of code to the game that gave me 50,000 experience per fight, even if I ran away. Yes, I cheated, but the game also cheated me by making it difficult to even level to begin with. So I was ready to go to the Lost Forest and even get some new personas. Entering the Lost Forest, it is a similar experience to the subway terminal. One way passes along with some new spinny tiles that spin you in a 90 degree angle, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. It's a relatively short area, as the place we're going to is the gingerbread house. In it, we meet a girl named Mai. How do we know her name is Mai? Maki just had a really good guess. I think. She knows about Aki and describes her as the evil Mai. Aki came out of her after she got in contact with Kandori. Maki notices that she has the Half Moon Compact, and we need her to give it to us. Mai insists that it grants her wishes, and she used it to make this town. Mai, you made one house and a bunch of red trees everywhere. You did not make a town. You're just a bad indie developer. Anyway, Mai is hiding in her town because Aki is using the other half of the compact to cancel any magical thing Mai does. But how did you even build this town then, Mai? Would you be unable to make it in the first place? Hmm. Loopholes aside, we try to convince Mai to give us a compact to get to the mana castle and fight Kandori. But Mai isn't interested in that idea because we'll be playing into Aki's hands and giving her the compact. From here, we, the player, tell her to stop hiding for everyone's sake. And Mai is relatively responsive to this line of reasoning, and then gives us the compact. But not before asking, out of nowhere, what are you living for? D Jesus, what? Why? Out of... Uh, okay, um... To find my reason? Is that a good enough reason? Mai thinks so, and sets us on our way to the mana castle. Before going to the castle, I went to Igor to get some new personas and with my new cards, and I happily spent my time looking at the new personas that I can obtain. After about 30 minutes of browsing, I made my choices and was ready to assign them to my party. And here is when I learned of another requirement for personas. You have two separate levels in Persona 1, your character's level and your persona's level. If your persona level is too low, you can't equip a persona of that level. <laughs> That's right, there's an additional persona level that needs to be leveled up by using persona abilities, and it's equally as slow as leveling up normally. Well, at least I can use these spell cards now to get away from demon fights, so it'll be easier to escape. Huh. Upon arrival, K seems concerned about placing a compact in the pedestal. If you talk to him, he says this. The dirty, the dirty pool, Kendori. Why'd you say that? Why'd you say it's a dirty pool? Why, why did you say that? We placed a compact in a pedestal and it went exactly as you expected. The compound is taken from us and the pedestal sinks to the floor. On a brighter note, the door opened. So uh, that's a plus. Kay gives us the I told you so lecture, which no, no you did not. And we set foot into the castle. Into the castle, we are greeted with plants, traps, powerful gin, and horrors beyond human comprehension. Y'all. The floors are made of marble and the walls are made of stone, as if the place was made from the foundations of an old ruin. The area itself is nothing really right home about. Just the same old, same old with high encounter rates. After making it through the fog maze, we finally meet up with Kandori and Aki. On the floor, we see Riji. Oh, uh, mm, right. I didn't bother to mention him because he will only hear for a brief moment in the alternate school unless you make him join your party at the very beginning of the game. But hey. He's here now. Please pretend you sound interested in his presence. 
Anyway, Maki tries to convince Aki that Kendori isn't her dad, but is uninterested with the idea. Kendori lectures us about the two compacts that have now merged together into his hand, officially becoming whole. His plan with the compact? Using the mirror that's similar to the one that Jusato used, he shows us his vision. wants to usher in the new era of the world with his new palace, the Diva Yuga. With it, he'll be able to transfer to each dimension without the need of the Diva system, and as a result, wielding the Rod of Judgment upon the human race. Kandori transfers to the real world, leaving behind Saruva, ushering in the fifth boss fight. Okay, I'm gonna level with you here. There isn't a whole lot to mention about this boss. It's similar to the one in the subway, which I kind of forgot the name, which is kind of proving my point. There is nothing really to mention about them, aside from their background, which, in this case, they are a, quote, arc demon of oppression. <laughs> okay. And they're the, quote, eternal opponent of Amisha Spenta of Desirable Dominion Karshla, who isn't even in the SMT slash Protona games. So take that information as you will. After the fight, Riji says there might be a way to get back into our world if we go to the Haunted Mansion. So off we went to the spooky mansion at the southmost side of town. The Haunted Mansion has the same layout as every area in the game. It's a spooky place with scientists hanging around concerned about Kendori's actions. When you get to the portal room guarded by a strong demon? Maki? It replies. It sounds like Maki's mother. I don't have a mother, Maki replies. But she does. In fact... We have actually spoken to her mom in the normal world, but this doesn't look like her at all. What's going on? We need to make a decision, though. If we don't attack, we, she'll get the jump on us. But if we jump on it first, it, what if it actually is her mother? We lower our weapons and hear it out. A bright light flashes before our eyes, and a demon transforms into Maki's mother. Turns out she teleported into this realm through the teleporter, but wasn't sure why she was turned into a demon. The teleport begins to flicker. It is going to go out. Setasuku opens the passage for us, staying behind as we face Kendori for the last time. Kendori has become a god of the new world. The Diva Yuga is covered with hieroglyphics and Kendori's men encouraging the end of the humans. After doing a puzzle, it took me a little bit too long to figure out. Draw loss? <laughs> Can I? <laughs> Did I draw it? The party arrives in front of Kendori, and by his side is Aki, ready for their final showdown. Kendori is just sitting there. Huh. He tells Aki to go to the room. He's not interested in fighting. What are you living for? Kendori asks. What? Why are you asking me this? People are not strong enough to live without a goal. Everyone wants something, no matter what it is, big or small. A goal gives us the strength to carry on through hardships. But if your goals are completed, then what is there left to do? The only thing left would be the bottomless solitude, eternal emptiness. Rather than completing his goal, he chose to remain stationary, refusing to pursue his goal. So he will always have a goal. Kadori asks us one more time, why do you cling on to life? For Masao, he wants to do the best he can every day. Hidehiko wants to be a better person instead of running away from his fears. And for us, we want to find our reason. We may not truly understand our reason for living, but it's important to continue through hardships in pursuit of that answer. Everyone had a perfectly acceptable answer. Maybe our reasons will change as we grow. From being popular artists with a ton of friends to just being accepted by the ones we love, like we have seen with Chiseido, we still find our reasons as we go. Kadori believed that there was no point if we pursued meaningless goals. So why not end the human race? K believes that this line of thinking comes from his anxiety of the future and what it has to offer. Maybe nothing good will come of it. Kadori stands up, starting the sixth boss fight. Kadori starts off by using his persona, Narlathotep, also known as the Faceless God, along with several other names. An outer god in the Cthulhu Mythos. The Faceless Gods are exiled in the stars, where they are sent to sleep, 
however, unlike the other gods, Naralatotep was active and frequently walked the earth, looking for ways to agitate the universe into madness, woe, and discord. He would manipulate humans into believing that he can grant them any power they want in exchange for their humanity. And it looks like Kendori took his offer. Kendori collapsed, defeated by the party, but Naralatotep has other plans for Kendori and enters the body, becoming God Kendori. The body of Kendori is on top of Nirlathotep. Kendori is explicitly being used by the Faceless God more bluntly than he already was. After defeating him once again, he falls. With his last breath, he confesses that K is right. This is the only way of life he knew, and is now content with his fate. He tells us that we have solved Maki's puzzle, that you and the people of your world were mere figments of a certain imagination. Maki's imagination. The Maki that has been with us is the Maki that she sees in herself, the ideal version of herself. Maya and Aki are also just shadows within her heart. The world we are currently in is one that was molded by memories of Maki until the day she was in the hospital, which is why there is no police station or hospital in this world, but the mansion and school are still intact. Kaidori tells us that Maki somehow got into the diva system and that her wavelength is synchronized with the system and must have used that power to make this world. Maki denies this. This can't be true. Then go meet your true self. We enter Maki's hospital room in the center of the castle. The real Maki is strapped down on a bed with wires and medical equipment attached to her body with Aki standing next to her. You idiot! You killed the only real person we can trust! Aki screams. There are officially three Makis. The one that's separated into Mai and Aki, the ideal Maki who has been in our party this whole time, and the real Maki that is in the bed, hooked up to the diva system. I've made everyone suffer, Maki exclaims. But you were being used, Hidehiko counters. You don't ask for this to happen. I was jealous of everyone, wearing cute clothes, walking around town, gossiping about boyfriends. She wanted to live that life, but couldn't. Maki was envious of others, wishing that the school and town would be swallowed up. As her journey grew, she made up an ideal town, one that would be destroyed. And she could be the hero the town needed. She doesn't believe she deserves to live. She uses the mirror behind the bed and asks to be taken back into her heart. As she fades, the party grows worried. Masao wants to follow Maki, but Kay reminds us of the story of Pandora. The story goes like this. Pandora, a young woman, receives a box with the directions to not open it. As time went by, Pandora felt tempted to open it. It beckoned to be opened. Pandora finally cracked and opened it. Little did she know, she would make a drastic error. She let out monsters beyond human comprehension, monsters spread diseases, sickness, and death onto the world. The box was hastily shut closed, but it was too late. Everything that was in the box was gone. All except one little butterfly. It pleaded to Bendora to be let out, and she did. In return, the butterfly was kind, unlike the other monsters in the box. It flew out of the box and wandered off, helping others. Using the story, Kay goes on to propose an idea to destroy the diva system, metaphorically destroying the box, and as a result, possibly killing Maki. Masao is fierce with this idea. How dare you say that to our friend? But what else can we do? If we keep the diva system active, humanity as we know it will be doomed. And Masao does the one thing I've been waiting for for a very long time. <sighs> Finally. Even though Maki's intentions was to hurt everyone, she is still our friend. We must do something to help her break away from this machine. Kay agrees that this is the best decision despite his adult style of thinking. Unfortunately, as a boy of 17, I am not legally considered as an adult yet. Like, shut up. Like, who? who? Hold on. Yeah, I don't know who asked, to be honest. The plan is clear. Use the mirror to get to where Maki is. Sounds easy enough. Oh. 
Well, how about a plan B? Maybe if we find another mirror, we can use that to make our wish and to get to Maki? There's a broken compact next to Masao, but that won't do. Hey, if this Maki has a compact, maybe the real Maki does as well? Hideko finds one in the real Maki's possession, but it doesn't seem to work either. Maybe if we check this corner randomly, we could find something useful, like a shard of Kendori's mirror. Hmm, how convenient. We put it into the broken compact, and we get sent back to the lost forest. Maki's mom is there. Hey, it's good to see you. And we make our way with her into the lost forest. We find Mai, scared and wanting her mother. We ask for Mai's help to find a real Maki, but she refuses to help. She can't find her because Aki wants the world to go away. Aki went to Pandora. After breaking the seal, Aki got swallowed up by Pandora, trying to destroy the world. Mai and Aki are split from wanting to help her and wanting the world to end. We must find a way to help. We can get to Pandora using the mirror in the school library, but we will need three compacts in the ideal Maki. We currently only have two compacts. We need to find Maki and another compact. The ideal Maki is deeper in the forest. When we find her, we notice she's missing her face. It It's all my fault. Don't just see the monster that I am. Masao tries to reason with her. Everyone gets jealous and that she was a victim of Kendori's scheme, but this falls on deaf ears. You know it, don't you, Naoya? I'm the worst girl alive. And then we're reminded of Kendori's last message to us before dying. She needs to discover her true self. Don't let her go down the lonely path that I went through. Don't hide like that, Maki, Naoya replies. You speak of pity, Maki, but don't make me laugh. We came on our own, Kay says. We can relate to you. If you want to die, then so be it. But you're our friend, and we can never put you behind us. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Maki's expression changes. It seems that the words of her friends have moved her greatly, and removed the mask that covered her. She's ready to face whatever comes her way. Now that everyone is with us, it is time for to find the last compact, which can be found in the Alea Cavern. After getting some equipment and LARPing as a kick streamer, what makes this look like we're a gambling stream, you know what I'm saying? A fedora? All right. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. I gotta find one that's actually transparent. There we go. <laughs> we're officially... <laughs> We're officially a kick street. It was time to go to the cavern, which is located in the shrine. Philemon meets us for the last time. He tells us the cavern leads to the sea of mankind's soul. All souls are born there and return there. Maki's soul is there, and we need to visit them. Only those who are summoned can go in there, and that is only us and Maki. So inside we go. The cavern is a dark crypt. The walls are covered in teal blue, representing water, and more importantly, change. As we go through the cavern, there are an optional room that we can visit. If we don't open it, we see our, our, ourselves playing video games in a cold, empty room. <laughs> Who would do that, eh? Hey, fun fact, the game that our self is playing is called Groove On Fight, a fighting game that Atlas made in 1997. A 2v2 fighting game with two one-on-one -on -one fights happening simultaneously, and the players can swap with the other teammate to fight the other one. Couldn't find any reviews of the game except for the one that GameStop made, which was a 6.3 out of 10 and refused to elaborate. What a shame. The gamer, Naoya, yeah, is the same as us, a second year student in St. Hermeline High School. Maybe this is the true us. He's known everything that we've done up to now, from helping the nurse to telling Maki to never give up. He's seen everything we have done. He is pleased with who we become. From becoming the best version of ourselves, we are given a skill card that awakens the strongest persona in our soul, Amun Ra, a combination of the god Ra and Amun. He represents the essentials that are hidden in the revealed divinity. We have officially obtained the ultimate persona and we can face any challenge that comes our way. Going to the bottom of the cavern, we see a sea of thousands of Makis. Maki. I found you, the real Maki. The real Maki is passive, unfazed to see us. As she hides in her bubble, it floats away. Maki tries to catch up. Those 
countless bubbles. Each are a different person's consciousness. We are one in a million. What makes us so special? The true Maki believes that her consciousness should have never been born, as others such as the ideal Maki would have done significantly better. But you can. We can be the ideal versions of ourselves that we desperately want to be. It may take time and a lot of change, but that's okay. It is not a race to be the best version of yourself. And that may change as time goes on. The true Maki helps us give us the last compact. Unsure of what we said even got across. We brought her back to the shrine, ready to face the mirror. We're now in a video world. The place is like the cavern except grayer and more ruined. Dark fog mazes take up the dungeon, and at the bottom of the floor is covered with dirty water that poisons us as we spiral around and around the bottom floor to get to the final room. We are faced with Pandora, and behind it is the Diva system. Pandora will use the system to make a paradise, a place where nothing exists. There is no gate to paradise, Maki speaks up. It's a Pandora's box that will bring evil to this world. Everything is useless, utterly useless, you, me, useless. And thus, the final boss begins. Pandora is the ultimate expression of Maki's nihilism. She is the grotesque version of herself, multi-limbed and two-headed, possibly one of the heads being Aki's, where she was devoured after waking her. After defeating the monster, she blossoms into a butterfly. Why won't you give up? Please, please give up, please. The butterfly is supposed to represent hope, but here it doesn't. The butterfly is sometimes associated with deceptive expectations, like defeating a large monster and defeating the odds. This was a very hard fight, and after much grinding, I finally beat Pandora. Why won't you give in? How are you so strong? Pandora cries once more. It's because we work together, Hidehiko explains. We believe in ourselves, Masao chimes in. We as people cannot live in isolation. If things get hard, just look around. We'll be there, Kay proclaims. Pandora thanks us and fades away, leaving a bright orb. The screen fades to white, with Naoya Maki alone. I'll send all of you back to the real world. One second. Thank you. I hope you'll still think about me at least once in a while. Goodbye. I love you. Goodbye. We then see Philemon, happy to have found our true selves. The smiles we wear will no longer be fake. We have found our true selves. Even if you find yourself in trouble or stuck again, do not be afraid and look within yourself. Now go forth into your bright futures. Face reveal! This is Dream! The Dream face reveal! Oh shit, is this how Dream felt when he like did a face reveal? He's like, I'm taking it off, I'm ascending. <laughs> Eventually, the events that took place here will become a distant memory, and normality returned to the town. Despite heavy attention to the media, the identities of the students were hidden. Time has passed since, and we have become more mature and ready to face the world's challenges. Maki has won an award in a major art exhibit, and now works as an artist with lucrative commission offers. Masao went to New York to do street art, where he received critical acclaim, and sometimes highlights of his work will have reached the Japanese news. Kay started working as a salesman for the Nandro Group anonymously. 
he become more mellow after the events. Some have even spotted him sleeping on the train, still wearing his number one tie. Hidehiko rose to fame and fortune, still telling stories of his high school days at the TV talk shows. He still tries to keep tabs on Masao, and is excited about any news that comes up about him. As for you, that is for you to decide. As I'd finish this video, I wonder what this game meant to me. And after a few months, I feel like I'm able to finally answer that. Persona 1 wants to open your version of Pandora's box. Let me explain. While the original story Pandora discourages the listener to open boxes as it might lead into devastating things that you can no longer return back to. To me, that is not what the game talked about. In my opinion, the story of Pandora encourages us to take a leap of faith and to pursue something we were told that we could never pursue. Maybe because you were not creative enough, too old, or too stupid to even bother trying. Well, the box has challenges that may be unforeseeable, like the price of equipment, losing friends over your passions, or even sacrificing other commitments so you can do it yourself. Remember the butterfly. Much like Maki, we may never be the ideal version of ourselves to start something new. In fact, the ideal version of ourselves may change as time goes on. Is this game good? God no, I recommend you watch a video and claim you played yourself, because the story is worth listening to. Hell, if I stop making spin-off games after this one, I won't have the series I love so much. So pick up your pen, draw something unique, write that short story, hit render on your project, get that podcast starting, it doesn't matter, get yourself out there. It's going to be bad, really, really bad. And you may even question why you even bother trying, but believe me, it'll be worth it in the end, as eventually, if you keep at it, you keep trying, you'll make something beautiful. Now go.